Hi, everyone. My name is Jason Samaha. I'm an assistant professor at the University of California at Santa Cruz. I'd like to thank the organizers of this trainee conference. It's a really unique opportunity to share some of our lab's research, and I hope I get to chat with uh, many of you watching this. So our lab at Santa Cruz is the Computational and Cognitive Neuroscience Lab, and we're broadly interested in the neural basis of conscious perception, neural basis of top-down effects in perception, like attention and expectations, as well as computations and neural mechanisms underlying decision-making and metacognition. Today, I'll be focusing just on some of our work looking at conscious perception. And in particular, I'll be advocating for an approach in science known as triangulation. And the basic idea behind triangulation is that any single method or any single experiment or any single analysis by itself is going to have some kind of confound, especially when trying to isolate neural correlates of consciousness. Therefore, the approach that we're currently taking and plan to take in the future is to apply different methods that all control for one confound that the other method has, and with the hopes that the true neural correlates of consciousness should show up in across all of those different approaches. That's what I mean by triangulation. Now, what do I mean by consciousness? Well, when I talk about conscious perception, I'm going to defer to what I think is a relatively uh, agreed upon use of the term in the field. Of course, there are some who disagree. But by and large, many people have in mind what Thomas Nagel had in mind when he wrote his 1974 paper, What Is It Like to Be a Bat? So the idea is that a mental state or indeed an organism has a conscious mental state if and only if there is something it is like to be that organism. So a perceptual state is a conscious one if and only if there is something it is like to be having that perceptual state. I think this definition captures many people's intuitive idea of what conscious perception is, but what I like about it is that it highlights the fact that conscious perception is not just the ability to respond to a stimulus. It's not just the ability to have a reaction to a stimulus. In fact, conscious perceptions specifically are those that have a subjective experience or a feeling. There's something it is like to have a conscious perception, and there's nothing it is like to have a non-conscious perception. So how can we measure this? It's already going to be tricky because we've, uh, based on this definition, ruled out the fact that it's merely information processing. There has to be some subjective component or subjective experience to it. And why might we think this is the case? Well, it turns out that there are um, experimental cases in the form of this neurological syndrome called blindsight, where it can be shown that conscious perception is dissociated from information processing. A blindsight is a relatively rare neurological condition, often resulting from stroke or sometimes uh, some accidents, where an individual loses part of their primary visual cortex. You can see in these three MRI scans, these are three different patients, oh, sorry, horizontal structural scans, and primary visual cortex should be right here in this uh, sulcus. This is the calcarin sulcus. V1 is right in the sulcus. And for patient BT, you can see they're missing a large chunk of primary visual cortex as well as higher order cortical areas. Patient HK here is also missing a smaller chunk of their primary visual cortex. Patient WF is missing an even smaller chunk of the primary visual cortex. And what happens in blindsight is that these individuals will claim that they are blind in part of the visual field. So below each MRI scan, you can see this is a representation of the patient's visual field. And any area that is denoted in gray is some point in space where the uh, patient would deny having any kind of conscious perceptions. That's interesting in and of itself, but what makes blindsight particularly interesting and relevant for consciousness is that these patients will, when asked to perform a discrimination task, meaning when asked to uh, discriminate between two stimuli that are presented in the blind field, they might be as good as 60, 70, or even 80% accurate at discriminating that stimulus. So they're able to process the information in the blind field, and give an accurate response, even though they deny having any conscious perception of the stimulus. So conscious perception, as indicated in these blindsight experiments, is not equal to the capacity to discriminate a stimulus. In fact, unconscious processes can be quite sophisticated and can even suffice for fairly accurate discrimination behaviors. So what implications does this have for the science of consciousness? 
Well, for one thing, when we're going to look for the neural correlates of consciousness by using fMRI or EEG or intracranial physiology or uh, single unit recordings in animals, we should try to find contrasts between different conditions that differ only in conscious perception, that don't differ in, for example, information processing. Likewise, when we're trying to study the function of consciousness, many people are interested in this question. That is, what behaviors does consciousness enable? Well, then we should try to rule out the influence of unconscious processes by keeping them constant across our experimental conditions. And this point has really been driven home uh, recently by Hakwan Lau, Dobi Ranev, Ariel Zilberberg, Ai Kazumi, Megan Peters, Brian Maniscalco, Brian Odegaard, Jorge Morales, and Richard Brown. Many others as well have pointed this out. So we can ask the question then, do most experimental approaches so far actually isolate consciousness in the sense that they control for these performance confounds? Well, here's a typical approach to studying conscious perception. You might use some kind of stimulus suppression technique like backwards masking. Maybe you present a target and you follow that by the appropriate mask. And if you get the timing just right, you can render that target subjectively invisible. Another approach to setting consciousness is to keep the stimulus constant, always have a near threshold stimulus. For example, here, you might see there's a very faint uh, vertical luminance grating, little black and white bars on top of this gray background. And you present that over and over again. And sometimes subjects will report seeing it, and sometimes they won't. And then what do you do with these kinds of uh, approaches? Well, in the masking case, you might contrast brain activity when the stimulus was suppressed and unconscious versus brain activity when there was no mask and the stimulus was unsuppressed. However, this is going to have a confound. Namely, there's going to be stimulus differences. In one case, the stimulus is masked. In the other case, it isn't. So the stimulus is already different. Maybe the brain activity isn't due to differences in conscious perception in one case and no conscious perception in the other case, but rather it's just due to a difference in the stimulus. And a bit more insidious confound, as we've already alluded to, is the fact that performance is going to differ quite radically between these two conditions. When the stimulus is suppressed, uh, performance should be really quite low. When the stimulus is unsuppressed because you remove the mask, the person has a conscious perception, but they're also going to be performing the task, processing the stimulus much better. So you might compare, uh, combine this with the near threshold constant stimulus approach. And you present the same stimulus over and over again. Sometimes the, trial, the stimulus is seen, sometimes it's unseen. But then you have to ask yourself, why was it seen in one case versus unseen in the other case? There's a potential confound here, which is that maybe when the subject saw the stimulus, they were just paying more attention on that trial. So now you compare brain activity between seen and unseen conditions, and maybe the seen condition has more attention, not only more awareness. And again, this performance confound is going to crop up even in this approach. When the subject sees the stimulus, they're much more likely to be able to discriminate it and process it well. When the uh, stimulus is unseen by the subject, they're probably going to be much worse at performing some discrimination task about the stimulus. So what can we do to get around these performance confounds and try to control for them in our experimental approaches? Well, the so-called relative blindsight paradigm has been introduced by Hakwan Lau and others. And more recently, this has been extended to a variety of stimuli, including motion stimuli. So here we've been using this approach in our lab to try to find the electrophysiological correlates of conscious perception. And the way this so-called relative blindsight paradigm works is you try to find two different conditions that have the same level of uh, performance, but different levels of conscious perception. Here we do this by using a dot motion stimulus and we can psychophysically titrate the number of dots moving in one direction versus the other direction. In this example, we have 50% of these dots moving to the right and 20% of the dots moving to the left. The subject's task here is to identify which direction contains most of the moving dots. So the correct answer would be to the right. And here we have another condition where there's fewer dots moving to the right, only 25%. But there's also fewer dots moving to the left, only 6.1%. And the rest of the dots in all these examples are moving in random directions. So by titrating the ratio of dots moving to the right and dots moving to the left, 
we can make sure that performance is the same in these two conditions. What's interesting though, is that for reasons that are somewhat uh, not understood, although there's theories out there, this situation, according to prior research, produces higher reports of conscious perception, whether it be through visibility judgments or subjective confidence ratings. We verify this in our own data by replicating this experiment. What I'm showing you here is um, a graph that shows the change or the difference in accuracy between these two conditions on the x-axis versus the difference in confidence in those two conditions on the y-axis. Each point here is a single participant in the experiment. And the fact that every single participant is above the horizontal line means they all had higher confidence in this stimulus condition versus this stimulus condition. But notice the individuals are all distributed rather evenly around this vertical line. There's some to the left of the vertical line, some to the right of the vertical line. So indeed, on average, there's no change in accuracy, but every single subject reports higher confidence in that decision, as though they had a uh, more intense or more vivid conscious experience of the motion stimulus. So now we've successfully dissociated subjective uh, awareness from objective accuracy or stimulus processing capacity. We combined this with uh, neural recordings, in this case, electroencephalography. And here we're particularly interested in a component of the EEG. It's known as the CPP, the central parietal positivity. This is one example subject. You can see there's a uh, uh, positive voltage distributed over parietal electrodes. And the slope of this signal, in other words, how fast it changes, has previously been linked to the accumulation of sensory evidence towards a decision. So we analyzed the CPP component by measuring the slope or how rapidly that CPP component changes over time. And according to models of perceptual decision-making, when the stimulus is easy or when you respond quickly, it's because you accumulated evidence faster and the slope should increase. We're able to verify that in this particular recording. Here's a CPP, uh, this is the ERP time lock to the stimulus sorted by different reaction time levels. Fastest reaction time in light blue and the slowest reaction time in uh, purple. What you can see is that this signature of evidence accumulation tr predicts the subject's reaction time. It shoots up a little faster on really fast trials and it shoots up a little slower on slow trials. This is even more evident in the same data but now aligned to the time of the response. This is when the subject actually pressed the button you can see fast reaction times are associated with a rapid increase in the CPP component. And slow reaction times are associated with a much, much slower increase in this uh, CPP component. Moreover, the same ERP component predicts the accuracy of the observer's decision. It shoots up a little faster when they're correct versus incorrect, as seen in both the stimulus-aligned data and the response-aligned data. So, so far this seems to track the formation of the subject's decision. Now the interesting result here is that this same signature also predicts the confidence of the individual's response. If we sort by high or low confidence ratings, you can see the CPP shoots up a little faster for high confidence compared to low confidence in the stimulus locked and in the response locked data. But here's the really novel condition. Because all of these previous results, the for example, this change in confidence is also correlated with a change in accuracy. However, we were able to um, dissociate those two factors by doing this relative blindside approach. And what we see is that in the stimulus condition that was high positive evidence, the same ERP component is also shooting up faster for the high positive evidence condition, which was associated with higher subjective reports of confidence with no change in objective accuracy. So it seems like the signature of evidence accumulation tracks subjective awareness even when you control for objective performance. In a way, it's like a weaker, milder form of blindsight. Just want to highlight that this experiment was conducted in my lab by two undergraduate students, Alenka Graham Castaneda and Yemi Martinez Arango. Alenka is now a PhD student with Megan Peters, and Yemi will be looking for uh, PhD positions soon. So this is just one example of how we can control for performance confounds. There's many other approaches um, that 
many labs are exploring in the literature. But this is where triangulation comes in because now that we've introduced these two different stimulus conditions to control for performance, we've introduced another confound, which is there's actually now a stimulus confound. So the high positive evidence condition is a different stimulus. In fact, all these kinds of relative blind sight paradigms suffer from the stimulus confound. Therefore, I'm gonna argue that this approach should really just be one arm of the triangulation uh, method. So we can use relative blind sight procedures to control for performance while having different levels of awareness. However, we introduce a stimulus confound. So what then can we do uh, to control for stimulus confounds? Other work in our lab is exploring the role of spontaneous brain oscillations in predicting subjective awareness. Here's one example of an orientation discrimination task. Subjects see this brief uh, stimulus flash on the screen. They have to decide if it was tilted to the right or to the left and then provide a confidence rating or in other experiments we've used visibility judgments as well. We then record EEG and we look at pre-stimulus data. So brain activity prior to the onset of the grading stimulus. We decompose the signal into energy and different frequency bands, such as low frequency uh, alpha and delta and theta oscillations and higher frequency beta and gamma oscillations. We then ask whether the amplitude of those oscillations prior to the stimulus predicts the subject's accuracy or their confidence ratings. We use single trial multiple regression to do this, and this result gives you something like this. This is a time frequency uh, regression map where the colors on this map indicate the relationship between power at a particular frequency and time point and confidence on the left-hand side and accuracy on the right-hand side. What this shows is that there's a significant negative correlation between low frequency power around 10 Hertz and the subsequent confidence rating that the subject gives. But the same activity does not predict the accuracy of the observer's decision. So that's great. Now we can, oh, I should point out, we recently published a review um, paper on some of these results, where we also summarize a, and introduce a computational model that can explain them in signal detection theory. Okay, but what's great about this uh, pre-stimulus activity approach is now we can sort our trials by high versus low pre-stimulus alpha power, for example, and that's going to produce, again, changes in uh, subjective awareness without changes in objective performance all while keeping the stimulus constant. So now we can control for performance and control for stimulus differences. But even this uh, approach has its downsides. I'm already showing that the brain is in a different state before the stimulus comes on the screen. So in a sense, there's a kind of brain state slash attention confound here because it wouldn't be surprising if the brain was in a different state after the stimulus, given that it's in a different state before the stimulus. However, if we combine that with traditional techniques such as stimulus suppression, which controls for pre-stimulus activity because you present the stimulus randomly, but has a performance confound, if we try to look for neural correlates of consciousness across all three of these conditions, then I think we've done a pretty good job in controlling for as many possible confounds as we can. And this is really the triangulation approach that my lab hopes to be taking in the future and that I hope a student joining the lab would be interested in pursuing as well. So just to wrap this up, the approach we're taking is to use multiple experimental methods with the idea that no single method is going to be confound free. But by systematically isolating possible confounds using psychophysical techniques and computational models, which I didn't get to talk about today, will slowly unravel the neural correlates of consciousness. Thanks so much for listening. I look forward to talking to many of you. Um, I just wanna point out some of the lab members who are working on this, Wei Do and Audrey Morrow, our two PhD students in the lab. And the lab is also um, uh, involved in a number of other initiatives. We're involved in large scale replications uh, through the Center for Open Science. And we're also pursuing environmental justice and uh, trying to combat climate change through grassroots action via a recently established um, coalition called the UC Green New Deal. So thanks for paying attention. If you'd like to learn more about the lab's research, our website is down here at the bottom right hand side of the slides. And my personal email address is here. I'm happy to uh, be in contact with anyone via email. Thanks so much.